Today we are continuing our sermon series on the Lamb of God in Revelation. Again, I want to thank so many of you for your kind comments about this series. I'm glad you are enjoying it. Jesus is referred to as the Lamb some 28 times in Revelation. And I've gone through and studied each of these passages to ascertain the thoughts being conveyed about the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, from each of these verses. Thus far in our journey, we've seen the slain lamb, the standing lamb, the saving lamb, the special lamb, the strong lamb, the severe lamb, the sealing lamb, and the satisfying lamb. You may be interested to know that in this series, we're studying a total of 15 pictures of the Lamb of God in the book of Revelation. This morning, though, I want to draw out just two more pictures of the Lamb in Revelation. And these are taken from chapters 12 and chapter 14. And they are rich in application to each of us this morning. In Revelation 12, we have what I call the shielding lamb. The shielding lamb. Revelation 12, read with me please, beginning in verse 1. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. Of course, the first duty in uh, appreciating this drama is to try to identify uh, the characters. Who is the woman? Who is the child? Sometimes that's easy. Sometimes it's not. From the words of verse 5, which we're going to study in a few moments, and based on the fact that uh, a messianic prophecy from Psalm 2 is utilized here, we can safely say that the child is in fact Jesus Christ. Who then would be the woman? That's where it gets a little harder. Some say it's the church, but that would mean the church gave birth to Christ instead of Christ bringing the church into reality. Some say the woman was the Virgin Mary, but there's great difficulty here with the woman fleeing into the wilderness to be nourished by God for a long period. That's mentioned later in this chapter. A view that seems more logical to me and which spits the contents of the whole chapter is to view the woman as representing God's faithful nation, true Israel, from whom the Messiah would come and representing God's faithful people who would be nourished and who would be protected by God during those periods of intense persecution. So when I look at the woman, I think about the righteous remnant of the Jews through whom Jesus came and which would eventually become the first members of the Church of Christ on the day of Pentecost. Of course, the Virgin Mary was a specific part of God's faithful people that brought the Messiah into the world. There was a remnant among the Jews who were faithfully keeping God's covenant during this time. Joseph and Mary were two of them. Zacharias and Elizabeth were two more who walked righteous in the commandments of the law. Now, if you'll turn over to Micah, I want to look at two verses there. The first one is Micah 4 and verse 10. Micah 4 and verse 10. And I think this position is supported by what Micah the prophet has to say. In Micah 4 and verse 10, Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shall thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon, there shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. So the faithful remnant, the daughter of Zion, 
would bring forth the Messiah. She would be like a woman in travail. And in the very next chapter, in Micah chapter 5, turn to Micah 5 and verse 2, here you have a prophecy of the birth of Christ and where he would be born. In Micah 5, 2, But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old from everlasting. Therefore will he be given, therefore will he give them up until the time that she which travaileth hath brought forth, then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. And it is through this faithful remnant that is mentioned that the man child would be born in Bethlehem and this new spiritual nation would be brought forth. She had the light of heaven upon her. Now back to Revelation 12 and verse three. He says, there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Well, here's our next step of identification. Who is the dragon? According to verse 9. If you look down in verse 9, here things are simplified for us. He's clearly identified. He's the devil. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He's great, symbolizing his influence. He's red in color, emphasizing his murderous character because he was a murderer from the beginning, Jesus said in John 8, 44. And even then he was working to kill the people of God. His heads, his horns, signify vitality and power. His crowns, the power to lead and to rule over. And that his tail can sweep the stars from the sky lets us know here is a formidable adversary. Now notice what it says about the dragon. The dragon stands near the woman about to give birth and his intention is to devour her child when the child appears. As we said, the pregnant woman, the righteous remnant with their promise of a coming Messiah, but that Messiah is threatened by the dragon, whom we've seen is the devil. Satan won't destroy Jesus from the very beginning. And it's, it's hard to read these words and not think of the events of the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. Herod the Great learned of the boy who was being born to be king of the Jews. His jealousy for his own position caused him to issue a command which called for the birth of every male child in Bethlehem, two years old and under. Matthew 2, 13-16. Herod allowed himself to be a tool in the hands of the devil. Now, a lesson of application for each of us is we must be on guard lest the devil tempt us to do unimaginably wicked things due to the sin of jealousy. He was able to tempt Herod to kill all of those babes of Bethlehem in an attempt to kill the Christ child because of jealousy. We ought to see from that the serious nature of jealousy and how the devil can tempt us through that to do unimaginably wicked things. In Revelation 12 and verse 5, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. 
Well, we thank God that God's eternal purpose and scheme of redemption could not be thwarted by the devil. It was from the righteous remnant that Christ was born, born of Mary, born of the seed of woman, born of the seed of Abraham, born of God's peculiar people. But even though he couldn't stop the birth, even after birth, Satan did everything in his power to discourage, to thwart, to hinder the work of Jesus. And I'm sure he must have thought he triumphed over him when Jesus died on the cross. He must have thought, I have defeated the purpose of heaven. Jesus is rejected by his own. He's abused by wicked men. He's been put to death. And yet the devil played into the hands of God. The greatest vindication of the Messiah would come in connection with his resurrection from the dead. And this was the child who was prophesied would rule all nations with a rod of iron. That's Psalm 2. Psalm 2 foretold it all of how the kings of the earth would set themselves against the Lord's anointed, but God would laugh in his heaven and would raise him up. In fact, in Acts 13, verse 33, Paul alludes to the passage and said, God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again, as it is also written in the second psalm, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. He alludes to the second psalm. This is talking about Christ, Paul says. God would raise him up. And then just a few verses later, the psalmist would say in Psalm 2 and verse 9, about breaking them with a rod of iron. He's speaking of his power. Since he's supreme, and since he has power, it's foolish for anybody to oppose him. Those that set themselves up are no match for God, no match for his anointed. He'd be raised up to sit on his throne and reign triumphantly. Now verse 6, Revelation 12. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. So after bearing the man-child and after his ascension, now the woman comes to represent all of God's people in Christ. Because if you look at verse 17, it says her children are those that keep the commandments of God and hold the testimony of Jesus. Well, are those that hold the testimony of Jesus Christians? Absolutely. And if you want to look over in Hebrews 11 and verse 40, you'll have these group mention, groups mentioned. In Hebrews 11 and verse 40, God having provided some better thing for us that they, talking about the faithful under the old covenant, without us, talking about the faithful under the new covenant, should not be made perfect. So here you have the woman now it's inclusive of the church. She flees into a place of safety provided for her by God. And there they, the, the, the child and God, nourish her for 1260 days. That is a period of persecution. Same period spoken of in the previous chapter in Revelation 11, 2 and verse 3. And let me just stop and say here that another lesson of application to us is that our convictions will place us in conflict with other people. That's what happened to those first century Christians. The world has always been an unkind place for those people who do God's things in God's way. You think about Abel. You think about Vashti. You think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You think about Daniel. You think about the church of Jerusalem. Whatever we might have to endure as Christians, we can be sure that God will know about it and that God will provide for us. And to the Jewish people, the wilderness spoke of God taking care of them. 
It spoke of divine provision. It spoke of God's fellowship from their experiences back there in the wilderness wanderings. And the main point of that is the faithful will be cared for by God. They're going to be shielded. Shielded by the Lamb. The devil seeks to devour the children of God just like he sought to devour the Son of God. Well, how can we be shielded from that? How can we overcome the devil? I want you to drop down to verse 11. Revelation 12 verse 11 is one of my favorite verses in the book of Revelation. It tells us how to overcome the dragon, how to overcome the devil and Satan. Revelation 12, 11, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives unto the death. Well, like our Lord, we can overcome the devil. Revelation 12, 11 tells us how. We're shielded by the blood of the lamb. It cleanses us and it keeps us clean. 1 John 1, 7 through 9. And just think about the benefits that we have through the blood. We have propitiation, which is being at one with God, with his wrath satisfied, Romans 3.25. We have justification, being viewed by God as if one never committed a single sin, Romans 5.9. Then we have redemption, being purchased, by God's love, away from God's avenging wrath. Ephesians 1 and verse 7. Fourth, we have reconciliation. Being brought back into the loving fellowship of God. Ephesians 2, 11 through 13. Then fifth, we have remission. Being liberated from the guilt of one's past sins. Acts 2, 38. Sixth, we have sanctification. Being set apart by God as one of his own. Hebrews 10, 29. And then in the seventh place, we have purification, being cleansed from the perversion of one's past sins. 1 John 1 and verse 7. Truly we're blessed by the blood of the Lamb. And when one truly knows and believes the word of God and trusts absolutely in the shed blood of the Lord, obtained by faith and repentance and confession of Christ, in baptism for the remission of sins and is willing to lay down his life for the message of the cross. There is no way that hell can win the battle for that person's eternal destiny. And you just think of how encouraging this dramatic scene must have been to those who because of their Christianity had little and suffered much. So we thank God for the shielding lamb. Now let's turn to Revelation chapter 14. And second of all today, let's look at the steering lamb. Let's look at the steering lamb. I don't know if I uh, remember everything about something that Martha showed me. I guess this was yesterday or day before. She showed me this cartoon about these two women and, and this woman could not drive. And uh, the woman said that the GPS on the navigation system wasn't calling out directions, it was saying prayers. I thought that was funny. We use navigation, we use maps, we use Google Maps, Apple Maps, to steer us in the direction that we need to go. Sometimes that works out well, and sometimes it doesn't work out so well. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1. And I looked and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having his father's name written in their foreheads. The 144,000 seen with the lamb in this chapter are the same 144,000 seen earlier in chapter 7. These are the redeemed. These are those purchased from among men by the blood of the Lamb, Acts 20 and verse 28. In contrast to those rebels that had the beast's name written on their forehead in 13 verse 6, these are identified with the Father and His Son. They have the divine name written on 
their foreheads. And as we saw last week, they've been sealed, they've been authenticated as faithful martyrs who refuse the demands of emperor worship. Now they're further described to us in Revelation 14. Look down in verses four and five. These are they which are not defiled with women for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now there are three descriptions of the redeemed in those verses. I want to notice all three of them, but I'm going to notice them out of order. The redeemed are said to be the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. They've been bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6, 20. And that word first fruits indicates the quality of that which has been given unto God. James 1, 18, of his own will begetting us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. And often in the New Test the Old Testament, the word first fruits refers to the sacrifices that were to be offered to God. So we are as first fruit sacrifices in the sense that we've been consecrated out of the whole number of people to God and we belong to God. We're the first fruits. Then second, the redeemed are the faultless before the throne of God. They are described as being not defiled with women, but as virgins. And I think that's figurative. I think that's a symbolic statement that just notes they hadn't given themselves over to impurity. They haven't given themselves over to idolatry, to spiritual adultery. They've not defiled themselves with the idolatry of emperor worship, which the Roman Empire demanded at that time. They demanded people fall down and worship for before the emperor. In contrast to those, you think about those that loveth and maketh the lie, and then you think about those with no guile that were found in their mouth. And I think about Nathaniel, an Israelite indeed, Jesus said, of whom there is no guile. So you have honesty, truthfulness as guidepost of the true Christian. And unlike the pagan world, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Here are people that didn't compromise their beliefs for the sake of other people. They had not subscribed to, they hadn't taught anything untrue. They would not forfeit their convictions. They are faultless, having died for their faith. And there before the throne of God and of the Lamb. And then third, you have the redeemed to follow the Lamb. The Lamb steers them, and they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Here you have a description that reveals the authority of the Lamb. That shows us his leadership. In John 21, 21 and 22, Peter seeing him said to Jesus, Lord, and what shall this man do? Jesus said unto him, if, he will, if I will that he tarry till I come. What is that to thee? Follow thou me. We're called to follow in the steps of him who did no sin, 1 Peter 2, 21. Of one who always did the Father's will. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine, thine be done. He was willing to do the Father's will. He was willing to take that cup. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Garden of Gethsemane he said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. He was willing to endure the cross. All the while despising the shame that was involved. Though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect or complete. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9. And so friends, the cross was before Jesus. And the cross, in the sense of being willing to pay any price to be faithful to the Lamb, is before every one of us every one of us during our life on earth. 
Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And those things demonstrate to us the kind of dedication that's essential to being a Christian today. And what a challenge this is in this day and time when so many people are inclined to follow their own inclination in religious matters. Go whithersoever they would instead of whichever way Jesus wants. You know, Jesus spoke of the blind leading the blind in Matthew 15, 14. The result, he said, is both shall fall into the ditch. So it's so important that we choose whom to follow. And in the spiritual realm, we've got two choices. We can follow Satan or we can follow Jesus. And Paul speaks of those two choices in his letter to Rome. He said, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether of obedience, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness, Romans 6.16. We follow Jesus, that results in failure. Following Jesus is the path to victory. And Revelation 14.4 says, the redeemed from the earth are those that follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. And the lesson of application to each of us is this. Are we willing to follow Jesus in spite of the sacrifice that we may have to make? Like the song says, who will follow Jesus standing for the right? Holding up his banner in the thickest fight, listening for his orders ready to obey. Who will follow Jesus serving him today? Here's the steering lamb. We ask you today, have you been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? There's a story that's told by Paul E. Tan that illustrates the meaning of redemption. He wrote about this preacher in Boston who met a young boy in front of the church building many years ago, and the boy was carrying a, a rusty cage in which there were several birds that were fluttering around very nervously, as you can imagine. And the preacher said, son, where did you get those birds? The boy said, I trapped them out in the field. He said, what are you going to do with those birds? He said, I'm going to play with them. And then I guess I'll feed them to an old cat that we have at home. Well, when the preacher offered to buy the birds, the boy exclaimed, mister, you don't want them. They're just little old wild birds and they can't sing very well. The preacher replied, he said, I'll give you $2 for the cage and the birds. Okay, he said, that's a deal, but you're making a bad bargain, the boy said. And the exchange was made, and the boy went away whistling. He was happy with his, with his shiny new coins that added up to a dollar. And the preacher walked around to the back of the church property, and he opened the door of the small wire coop and he let those struggling birds soar out into the blue sky. And so the next Sunday he, he took the empty cage into the pulpit and set it down on the pulpit and he used that to illustrate his sermon about Christ coming to seek and to save the lost paying for them with his own precious blood. And the preacher said, that boy told me that the birds were not songsters. But when I released them and they winged their way toward heaven, it seemed to me like they were singing. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed. You and I have been held captive to sin, but Christ the Lamb has purchased our pardon. He has set us free so that we can sing, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. If you need to respond to the Savior's invitation, we urge you to come. It's together we stand and sing.